Okay, so I'm very pleased to announce a new partner for us, uh, Graham Wynn, from, make sure I get the name right, it is from uh, Merodia, is that right? Merodia Therapeutics, uh, which is a new pharma startup uh, working in this area of olfactory disorders. Graham, over to you. Tom, thank you. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, firstly, um, as a uh, I think um, all of the co-founders of Mirodia found out recently we'd been pronouncing it wrong. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's still something we're working with. So firstly, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Duncan and Carl and all of the organizers of the meeting for such a, a fantastic conference. Um, it's been truly inspirational to be part of this, um, to meet many of you and hopefully to meet all of you throughout the rest of the course of the meeting and to hear about your individual journeys with olfactory loss and your, your lived experience of, of this. And um, hopefully, um, in the next sort of 10 minutes or so, I'll tell you a little bit about what our plans are here and where, where we're going. So, I mean, before you saw today's agenda, I'm sure most of you had never heard of Merodia, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to call it Merodia because it's just easier to say. Um, so my plan today is to tell you a little bit more about us, where we started from, and where we are heading. So we're a new company as Tom said, um, and we've got one mission, we've got one priority, and that is to develop new therapies, new medicines for people who are living with olfactory loss. So um, it's a, a really special occasion actually for us as well, because for the first time ever, after two years of Zoom calls, um, um, the four co-founders have actually had an opportunity to meet in person. So before yesterday, um, Myself, Andy Mulvaney, sat over there. I mean, Andy, maybe you can just stand up so people can see. <laughs> and uh, Jim and Brad, who you've, you obviously saw earlier, we'd, ne we'd never met each other in person. We have many, many hours of Zoom calls. Um, and uh, so it's obviously been really exciting for us to, to meet up. So as you know, Jim and Brad, they're academic experts. They've got decades of experience in the field of olfaction, olfactory science, olfactory regeneration. Um, and, I mean, personally, really enjoyed the summary that they've just provided. I hope you all did, too. So, Andy and I, um, both of whom I strongly suspect you have never heard of before today, um, we're both drug discovery professionals. Um, we have, between us, many years of experience of working in uh, the pharmaceutical industry in the discovery and development of new medicines for various diseases. Um, we've both been fortunate enough to have either invented or been closely involved with compounds that have made it um, into human clinical trials. So, um, you know, we feel we really bring a lot to this on a, on a professional level. So we've been interested in therapeutic applications of regenerative medicine for about 10 years or so. And we've heard this term used several times over the, over the past few hours, regenerative medicine. Um, and so what I want to do just to start with is to just explain you know, what that is, what, well, certainly what my take on that is. Um, and this is an area of medicine which basically seeks to capitalize on the natural repair mechanisms that exist within the human body and, and how they can uh, be used to fix problems when we incur tissue or organ damage. So this is uh, re regenerative medicine and repair of the body. It's, it's an active area of research, and it's something which a lot of companies are starting to pay attention to now. And you know, certainly we've known, and I think probably we all know in the room um, for a long while, that some parts of the body are pretty good at repairing themselves. Um, if you get a cut, um, that fixes itself. If you lose blood, that replenishes itself. The, the liver, the gastrointestinal tract, both are pretty effective at repairing themselves. However, other systems, other organs don't. Um, and we've already heard a little bit about why that is the case. And, and, and the differing behavior here is basically because a lot of these organs that naturally repair themselves, they have to deal with a lot of external insults. They have to interact directly with the external environment. And you know th this can throw quite a lot of horrible things at the system. So it's, it's really important that these, these, uh, these organs can regenerate themselves. So in around 2018, uh, we started looking at newer areas of regenerative medicine. The, these were ones which people perhaps weren't so aware of. Um, and they were ones which we thought may represent areas where new medicines may be needed. Um, we saw that one area in which there was a lot of interest emerging was in developing new treatments for hearing loss, and specifically those which would act by regenerating 
transcript by regenerating the cells within the inner ear, and therefore they'd restore the sense of, of hearing to people who were affected. And, and this got us thinking about the other senses that we have. And <clears throat> I remember a conversation Andy and I had, in, it was in October 2019, so this was before COVID. And Andy had spotted some literature which was focused on smell loss several months previously. Um, and we were chatting over a coffee and sort of, Andy was recalling this paper and was, was sort of musing over, you know, whether people losing their sense of smell was something that was experienced by many people. So, you know, even two years ago, you could see we, we had very little knowledge of this um, in, in the drug discovery community. And as we, we, we also started thinking, well, if this is something that's experienced by many people, would it be possible to develop new drugs to fix this? Um, and when we started looking into it more, we, we realized basically that the answer to both of these questions was, was a resounding yes. And so you could say this was our light bulb moment and this was what really kicked Merodia off. So in the pharmaceutical industry, when you start researching a new area of drug discovery, one of the first things you need to do is to talk to experts. And this is how we got to know Brad, Jim, Carl, and many, many others. And, and it was through talking to these academic experts that we really became profoundly aware of the huge number of people who were affected by olf olfactory loss or olfactory dysfunction importantly as well, the very significant impact that this had on their daily lives and overall well-being. And, and obviously by being at a meeting like this, you know, that, that just reinforces that further, certainly in, in our mind, but it also shows, of course, the challenges that we've got in getting everyone else to, you know, to understand this as well as we, we've heard. So it became apparent to us, though, that by combining our knowledge of drug discovery um, and our awareness of you know, how you develop new drugs with, with a pioneering work on regenerative biology uh, that was taking place in Jim and Brad's labs, um, that we realized that there were approaches that we could potentially use to develop new treatments for people who had problems with their sense of smell. And you know, as we've, we've heard, and as we know, there are multiple reasons why people lose their sense of smell or have problems with their sense of smell. And it's, it's really quite striking to think that the, the, these problems very often occur by um, a postage stamp sized piece of tissue in, in, in the nasal cavity. And we've obviously seen some, oh, actually, I can move on a slide. You don't want to see and look at before. So th this, this um, uh, you, you'll have seen some of these diagrams before, and I've just summarized very, very simply what we're, what we're looking to do here and, and, and what Jim has, has outlined. And as we've heard, under, under normal circumstances, the olfactory tissue, the olfactory epithelium, uh, regenerates and repairs itself very effectively, typically every few weeks, but certain conditions cause this regeneration process to stop and not restart. And this, this causes the olfactory epithelium and the cells which are responsible for detecting smells to become damaged or lost. And we've, we've obviously heard um, a lot about this a, a little while ago, um, including the most common forms, which are viral infection, including COVID, but of course also, also aging. So our approach, as, as Jim has mentioned, is to look to restart that regenerative process in the olfactory epithelium, to give the, to give the basal stem cells in there a kickstart to enable the tissue to repair itself and um, therefore to restore the sense of smell. So what we're planning to do is to capitalize on the years of work that Jim and Brad have been undertaking, studying the olfactory stem cells in the nose and to translate that pioneering research into a, into a new drug. So now, as you may or may not be aware, development of a new drug, um, it comprises several stages and it takes a while before it can get to the point where it can be approved by regulators. And the first of these stages is, is a very simple one, is to have an idea. Um, and here, um, that idea is that the stem cells in the nose can be reactivated to repair the olf olfactory epithelium. Next, we need to do the basic research to show that the idea is a good one, to show it's a valid hypothesis and that it works, um, to provide the evidence, again, as we've heard about earlier. So this research typically results in something which you could view as a prototype drug. Essentially, it shows that the concept works, but it needs maybe some tweaks or changes to make it most effective. Uh, so this is where we are now. Merodia's plan is to take the research that has started in Jim and Brad's labs and to optimize it so it will be 
and ef as effective an approach uh, as, as possible and, and provide a new drug which is ready to progress into clinical trials. And when we've done that, the final stage is to undertake those clinical trials. And, and you'll be aware from the work of Carl and others um, what this involves um, and how exciting it is when something gets to this stage. So in order for us to do this, um, we need a few things. First of them is a plan, a good plan, and you've, you've heard about that um, earlier, of course. This needs to be matched with a team of experts, um, and the other two things are money, unfortunately, and time. So you, you know a bit about the plan, as I've said, the team's in place, and so we've got the first two of these requirements. Where we are at the moment is we're in the process of raising the necessary funds um, from Rodi to undertake this work, and we're hopeful that this fundraising process will be achieved over the coming, over the coming months. Now, we're really excited by this, of course, um, but again, as uh, with, uh, you know, with other talks that we've heard, we do need to sort of sound notes of caution as well as notes of hope. Um, discovery of any new drug is extremely challenging and not all projects work out. So why do we think we're going to be successful here? So there's a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is the fantastic team that's involved in this. It gives us a huge amount of knowledge of the problems and the challenges associated with olfactory loss, but also a huge depth of understanding on the science of the regenerative biology in the nose. We've also got the proven ability to reduce it to practice and transform that basic science into a drug. And secondly, and I mentioned this, this area of research earlier, there's a clear comparison, um, certainly in my mind, with the companies who are developing treatments um, for problems with other senses, such as hearing loss. Um, this is still in itself um, a relative new area for drug discovery, and, but in only a few years, um, new therapies for hearing loss are starting to progress into clinical trials, and some of them are now starting to show real benefit to the patients who are taking them. So what this shows, in my mind, is that the regenerative approach as applied to new drugs for the human senses is very viable and could well be successful. So, I mean, I, I, this, this, this was only meant to provide you with a brief overview of what we're doing, and I'll, I'll wrap up here, but we're, we're, of course, keen to talk to people during the rest of the meeting, um, and we'll be keeping Fifth Sense, Duncan, and uh, the rest of the team up to date with how things go here. I'd like to leave you just with one reminder. I said it at the beginning, and I'm gonna say it again here, and I think it's so important to, uh, that, that everyone in this room knows this, and it's been you know, hugely impactful and profoundly moving for me to interact with many of you over the last day and yesterday at the Priority Setting Partnership, and to hear about, as I say, your individual experiences and how this, uh, this olfactory loss affects you personally in your day-to-day -day lives. And so I just wanna remind you that we we have, heard, we have heard this, we know the uh, effect it has on you, we know how many people are, um, are impacted in this, and we know that there are you know, relatively limited treatments available at the moment. So we're working every day to do something about this um, and to make new medicines available as soon as possible. And uh, as I say, you know, there, there is certainly, uh, we're very excited by this and we think there's, there's um, much reason to be very optimistic. So thank you very much. Um, have to take any questions. Well, I'm not going up straight away. If I can come right up into Bayo first, then I'll come to you, James. Hello. Um, Hi. I think this is the uh, most exciting part of the conference for me. Um, so, just asking, um, looking forward, do you think? Any medicines for this are likely to be in the form of a, like a nasal spray or is it likely to be oral or injectable? Any ideas? Yeah, so we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this um, and our, our thoughts here, and again, you know, Brad and Jim have mentioned this earlier, is that because of the accessibility of the target tissue that we're looking to intervene with here, we think that some kind of nasal delivery is, is likely to be the optimal route um, for a new drug. Now, that, that holds many advantages. Firstly, um, it provides direct access for the drug to the target tissue, so it means you can have a very low dose. Um, it 
and again, this was, this was mentioned earlier, if you're not taking a pill, then when you take a, a, a pill, um, it basically distributes the drug all around the body, and sometimes the effects of that drug on other parts of the body may not be what you want. Um, so if we can restrict the action of that drug to the tissue where it's actually needed, then that provides the option for a very safe and effective therapy. Now, what, what we think in terms of the delivery is we, we are interested in nasal sprays, but actually what we're thinking is that um, perhaps some kind of gel which the ENT specialist will apply um, specifically to the affected tissue will be, uh, will be perhaps the way to go in the first instance. Now, we, obviously, we've got a lot of work to do here, um, and there's uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of sort of basic research along the path, but that's, that's our thinking at the moment. Ultimately, we would like it to be something which is as easy and as convenient for patients as well, because that will obviously help more people. Um, but there's, a, yeah, so there's probably a few steps along the way. D d does that answer your, your question? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to echo what's just been said as well. This is really, really, really exciting. And I say that as somebody who's a congenital anosmic, and I've never had any expectation that I will ever have any um, ability to smell, but just the potential impact that it has on, on mm. people um, recovering something they've lost is just incredible. My question is, we've heard a, a number of people say over the course of the day, the impact of patient power and how powerful the patient voice is. So how can we, as patients, support you all right. to bring this forward, to help it um, get through funding and mm. you know, get the, how can our voice support you to do that, for one, and to do it more quickly? Well, first, I'd like to thank you for that very kind offer. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we've been doing as part of this, and I, I probably should have actually mentioned it at the same time I said about sort of talking to Jim and Brad, was, um, and, and Carl, one of the other, other people that we reached out to very early was Duncan. Um, because both Andy and myself have worked a, across a number of other disease areas, and we've known that that patient engagement and hearing that patient, or getting that patient voice to be heard is a critical part of getting any new drug approved, but particularly for an area which is perhaps less well served or less familiar to regulators and the like. So I'd, I'd also just make the, the observation as well that um, certainly we, as a, a new company, we are experiencing many of the same challenges which Fifth Sense and which you all individually are experiencing as well. We talk to um, a number of investors um, about our mission and what we're trying to do, and they come back to us with well, I'll just call it the shrug, you know. Some do get it, which is, which is important to highlight. There are people that get it, but that shrug is, is common as well. In terms of what um, patient groups and individual patients can do, um, well, firstly, having that engagement with Fifth Sense and us continuing to do that and to work closely together is going to be critical, and we're talking to Duncan continually about this, um, and that's something that we're going to be doing over, over, over the coming months. Um, the other thing is what we're trying to do is we're, we're, we're exploring ways, and we've been, you know, Jim and Brad and Andy and myself have been talking about this the past couple of days, has been how we can actually get that individual patient voice most strongly heard as well. And we, we haven't kind of like formulated all our ideas here, but certainly what we'll be doing is we'll, we'll, be, we'll be sharing those with, with, with Duncan, and then, you know, if there's things that we can do on a sort of an individual basis as well as with this sense, then, you know, we'll, we'll certainly be, we be sharing that as well. Okay. Okay, Duncan. Yeah, just. To... I mean, listen, just to add to that, and um, just to confirm everything, really, that um, uh, Graham said. Uh, you know, it's been. I think it's been best part of two years now, hasn't yeah. it? And it's we met for the first time yesterday. We met for the first time yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Even though you only live ten miles away from me. Yeah, I know. Is I, I moved to Banbury. And you live just down the road, as it, as it happens. Um, but yeah, listen, this is um, a relationship that we're um, very, very committed to. And um, see the you know see the huge potential in and and why today for me has been so important to bring Graham and Andy down here together with Carl, Steve, Jim, and Brad and um, and you know really sort of think about how can we you know how can we move forward together and and really transform things and uh, so yeah we're gonna we're gonna continue conversations. Yeah, watch and, watch this space. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the start of a very exciting journey, I think. Excellent, great. Thank you very much.